so thanks for coming. Uh, I appreciate uh, the interest. Uh, my name is Tony Collin. I see this works here. Yes. Uh, my name is Tony Collin. I'm a uh, local uh, software developer. Uh, do Ruby, JavaScript. Uh, um, my contact info is right there. T. Collin on Twitter, Tony at halogenlabs.com. And I am a huge radio nerd. <laughs> Uh, I've got, uh, I'm actually, I, I got interested in radio at the age of like, uh, probably like 12, 13. Uh, my dad was a, uh, had gotten his um, ham radio license, so I, it kind of rubbed off on me and uh, I actually got, I was licensed at the age of uh, 14 and at that time it was um, pretty much just a way of talking about like, you know, like, it just seemed like playing like fancy walkie talkies or something. Uh, um, my my interest in the hobby has actually grown more um, in the past few years. I've uh, upgraded my license, uh, got more more interested in the hobby uh, now that I have a little bit more free time. Um, so yes, I'm a, a licensed ham radio operator. That's my call sign. Um, I get to play with cool uh, cool gear like uh, little handheld radios that I can talk to other people in the metro area. Uh, you know, just uh, with a couple watts of power. Um, I get to play with even cooler equipment. Um, when I uh, talk to other people with my uh, my HF radio, and uh, this allows you to talk, um, you know, pretty much all around the world. Um, some of my uh, longer contacts would be St. Helena Island. Uh, you can see the uh, the line there going from uh, my house to roughly the middle of the uh, uh, South Atlantic Ocean. Um, I think I did that on like 100 watts. It was pretty cool. Um, probably a month or two ago, I talked to a guy in Russia, and it actually the I I was like that's interesting. Like my my antenna wasn't even pointed that direction. I talked to him, and uh, I realized, yeah, I went over the pole, and it was probably the aurora that was uh, causing that propagation. It was really, really cool to, to see happen. Um, another thing that really interests me about the hobby is that there's kind of a public service aspect to it. Um, I'm a uh, trained Skywarn spotter, so I'll go out and I'll, uh, when there's severe storms, uh, I'll go out and I'll report uh, things like, yeah, there's a wall cloud over in uh, near Northfield, and those reports actually go straight to the National Weather Service. And uh, the Skywarn Spires, uh, we're we're the, we're the eyes on the ground, and we, we fill in that 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 blank space between what the radar sees and what's actually on the ground. So, uh, a lot of times on the news, you'll hear, uh, you know, spotters confirmed the tornado on the ground, so and so, um, and that's uh, most of the time that's that's Skywarn Spires going out and doing that. Uh, we also get to do really cool experiments. Uh, does anybody know what what um, Spacecraft this is? Nobody? Nobody? Search for the J. Uh, it was the uh, Juno spacecraft, and um, it, it did a, so it launched in uh, August of 2011, went out into deep space, came back, and in October, it did a flyby of the Earth to uh, gain speed to shoot back out to Jupiter. Um, and one of the experiments that NASA um, wanted uh, amateur radio operators to do was to um, say hi to Juno, and the way we did this was we were sa we were sending uh, HI in Morse code. That's the did it did it, um, but instead of just you know tapping really quick, um, each dit was like 30 seconds long, um, and um, it took a few months for NASA to to process all the data from the spacecraft. But they eventually did hear. Uh, hear the radio waves um, from all the amateurs transmitting at, at the same time. It was really cool. So radio, it's all around us. Uh, you use it uh, every day. You've got your iPads, your, your phones, um, and we, we tend to take it for granted. Um, you just turn the radio on, you've got music coming out. Um, TV, cell phones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. I'm, my presenter thingy is is a wireless uh, RF uh, device. But how does it work? 
Does anybody know how it actually works besides you turn it on and you get internet? Magic, magic yes. Actually, not magic. What's that? Pretty well. Yes. It does. It's actually pretty reliable, and it's nice when you... Actually, I just did a, uh, a speed test of my phone on the LTE, and I was getting, like, 56 megabit downstream, and it was... It, it, it works pretty awesome. Uh, so what are the parts to a radio system? Uh, so you've got a, a, a audio uh, a signal, like somebody speaking, into a transducer or a microphone, like I am now, and that gets converted into electronic signal. Uh, and within the radio, it's processed and transmitted. Uh, whoops. And the antenna goes there. And once it hits the antenna, it turns into electromagnetic waves. And I'm glossing over lots of stuff. So you've probably seen these antennas all around the Wi-Fi antennas. Uh, you've got the, you know, the, uh, the Minneapolis Wi-Fi antennas just sticking out. Um, and these, um, I won't get into two details, but this style of antenna uh, radiates in sort of a three-dimensional donut shape. Um, I find that kind of stuff really interesting. I don't know if anybody else does. <laughs> so yeah, you've got uh, the electromagnetic radiation, which is radio waves. Um, so there's, there's two parts to that. You've got the electricity and the magnetic, the electric field and the magnetic field. And they're actually, uh, I've been doing research on this. I, I don't know why I find this so interesting, but the, the radio wave, the, the electric waves and the magnetic waves are essentially at 90 degrees to each other. And they, once they leave the antenna, they, they propagate out into space uh, like a, you know, like a, like a, like a wave in water. And, and they, the, the electric and the magnetic fields feed off each other and just continue out into space. So that's what, what a wave looks like, I guess, through the oscilloscope. So um, I'm going to define a few terms just so you guys get an idea. Um, hopefully it's pretty straightforward uh, or you've already heard it. So wavelength, uh, it's just you know, the, the, the distance between two uh, similar parts of, of, a, uh, of, a, of a wave. So there, 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 um, for whatever, whatever length that is. Uh, frequency is the 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 inverse of the um, of the wavelength, and we measure frequency in hertz or cycles per second. So if you've got this this wave over time, this would be a frequency of, of one hertz. If you increase the frequency, you've got four hertz, and you know this, hopefully this is pretty intuitive that you've got more cycles per second, and thus higher frequency equals shorter wavelength. And I'm going to flip through some math here. I'm not going to give you guys a test afterwards. Um, I know it's kind of boring. So lambda here is, we, you, this is a notation for wavelength, and it's just the velocity over the frequency. And you can actually invert that and get frequency is velocity over the wavelength. Wavelength in meters is the speed of light in meters per second over the frequency. And I'm glad, this is actually like 299.7 million meters per second, I'm just rounding up. Um, so let's, let's take 89.3, the current. So they broadcast on 89.3 megahertz, and we can simplify that a little bit. And we get a wavelength of 3.3 meters or 11 feet. Uh, likewise, this, uh, this little wireless device is like 2.4 gigahertz. Um, what the, the actual length between the waves is, is uh, about five inches. And down on the, the, shor the shortwave hand bands, we've got uh, on 14 megahertz, you know, wavelength of 20 meters or about 70 feet. And as hams, uh, we care about the, the, the wavelength because uh, in order to efficiently propagate radio waves out into space, uh, our antenna needs to be resonant on that frequency. So enough of that. Uh, so let's talk about radio spectrum. Um, Formally defined, it's, it's uh, from 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz, and a wavelength from either, from about 100 kilometers to one millimeter. So that's a pretty wide range of uh, uh, frequencies and wavelengths. And this is intentionally hard to see, but we've got the entire electromagnetic spectrum here on the left, zero, and cosmic rays over here on the right, and this, the, um, the radio spectrum is this highlighted portion. So zooming in, you've got the uh, shortwave stuff down here, 
HF, VHF, UHF, uh, microwave, and beyond. And this is also intentionally hard to see. This is the uh, US FCC allocation chart of all radio frequencies. <laughs> and uh, so we've got zero or three kilohertz up here, and we've got 320 gigahertz up here. So each, each uh, horizontal bar is actually 10 times larger than the previous one. So we're working with powers of 10. So we've got three kilohertz to 300 kilohertz up here, and then uh, 300 kilohertz to three megahertz, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, this is just a zoom in of uh, some VHF frequencies. Uh, we've got the FM broadcast stuff down here, and then kind of next to it is uh, uh, airplane kind of, uh, you know, airports, air traffic control. And uh, if I can find it, this little tiny sliver right here is the two meter uh, hand band. So that's, that's the little spot where we get to play. So AM broadcast, um, just your AM radio dial is about 530 to 1700 kilohertz. So it's, it's about 1.1 megahertz of bandwidth. So we just, we define bandwidth as the amount of space that a signal or a group of signals takes up. Uh, likewise, the FM broadcast band is about 25 meg 20.5 megahertz. And the uh, sort of the, the unlicensed high free, you know, Wi-Fi where um, like this guy operates, it's about 100 megahertz of bandwidth. So as you get up and as you get higher in frequency, um, more space gets taken up. So modulation. Modulation is a way of encoding information in a signal. So right now I'm I'm speaking and I'm modulating uh, this this wireless signal that goes to the speakers wherever they are. And so the simplest way of modulating a signal would just be turning a transmitter on and off. And if you do it, some long beeps and some sh some short transmissions, you end up with Morse code. Um, kind of interesting way to visualize Morse code. Uh, you've got your dits on the left and your dots on the right, so you can just follow this tree and figure out like which letter is where by going left or right in the tree. So AM modulation, um, this top, I can't even see my laser pointer. Uh, so this is what we call a carrier signal. It's just um, the, the analog, analog to a carrier signal would be uh, paper on a, page, on a page in a book. It's a, a means of carrying the information. And then we've got a modulating signal right there. And that would be the printed letters on the book. And when you combine these, you end up with an amplitude modulated signal. The frequency stays the same, but the, the height of the wave changes according to the modulating signal. Then we've got FM, which is frequency modulation. So it's, you've got your carrier signal, modulating signal, and then um, as the signal modulates, the frequency modulates. So another thing that really interests me about radio and um, just the hobby of ham radio is, is how radio waves propagate. Um, so there's basic things like line of sight, um, which is how this guy is working. It's just the signal is going straight to where it needs to be. Uh, ground wave propagation, where the, the waves actually follow the, the, the surface of the earth. Uh, sky wave propagation, which is uh, using the ionosphere to refract signals um, back down to a target. Um, and ionosphere is, is 60 to 500 kilometers altitude. And the ionosphere actually is composed of layers. And it changes throughout the day because of, um, because of the sun uh, radiating the, the atmosphere. Um, during the day, we've got a D layer, and we call it an E layer, and an F1 and F2 layer. And during the day, um, radio waves are usually just absorbed by the, the uh, D layer. So this is why you, in the morning when you, or during the day, you pretty much just hear local radio stations, especially AM. Uh, at night, 
uh, the D layer goes away and the F1 and F2 layers actually combine. And this is really interesting to me. Um, so you've got your normal uh, just line of sight propagation. Um, but we can also, if we get the frequency right, we can, we can actually shoot our, our radio signals into the atmosphere and refract them back down, back to, down to Earth. And there's some other characteristics of the ionosphere called like maximum usable frequency, where if, you, if, you're, if you're transmitting on too high of a frequency, the radio wave will just escape the ionosphere. So we get this. Um, we can also bounce radio waves off the ionosphere and back on, off the Earth and back up. It's called skip. You got skip distance. Um, on the hand bands, the skip distance is usually like 2,500 miles or so. We can also use the aurora to propagate our radio waves and uh, meteor scatter, which is also kind of interesting to me. So what's actually out there? So you got HF shortwave, you got broadcasters, hams, obviously, uh, government agencies, US or otherwise, weather facts. Um, ships will use weather facts to receive charts when they're out on the ocean. Number stations, if people have heard of number stations, it's just a voice reciting numbers and it's usually some sort of encrypted scheme. And also pirates, if you're lucky. And a lot more. <laughs> so usually if you, if you wanted, want to listen to shortwave, you need a radio like this. Uh, I don't know exactly how much this one costs. I've got a little one that's similar and it was like maybe 70 bucks. It's pretty, pretty decent. It's got a little ant uh, external antenna hookup. Um, so VHF and UHF, what's out there? You've got FM broadcasts, obviously, hams. Uh, you've got police, fire, uh, um, it should be EMS, so emergency, mall cops. Um, I live near the Minneapolis airport, so I hear the Minneapolis airport a lot, air traffic control. Um, ADSB, which is, uh, uh, um, you know, obviously fl uh, the MH, 370 flight was in the news because they didn't know where it was. Um, ADSB is a, a flight tracking uh, technology that you can uh, listen in on. There's uh, pagers, other texts, taxi dispatch. I read a blog about some some uh, woman who was decoding the the text messages on bus displays, which is really interesting. Baby monitors, kind of freaky. Um, baby. Uh, some of them are encrypted, some of them are not. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff in the uh, 433 megahertz band, which is like an unlicensed chunk of, uh, of uh, UHF. So things like wireless uh, weather temp uh, temperature sensors um, transmit on those frequencies as well. So if you want to listen on this, that kind of stuff, you previously have, would have to buy some crazy looking scanner like this. And I don't even know how much this costs. It probably, it's probably like 300 bucks or something ridiculous. Which brings us to software-defined radios and why you're all here. So this is a kind of an older generation software-defined radio. It's called like Win Radio or something. And you, you basically, it's just a box and you plug it into power, give it an antenna, and then you plug it into your computer and you can do stuff like this, which looks cool. It's maybe not the most nice UI to look at. Um, but you actually get, we are, you actually get like three or four chunks of spectrum that here that you can independently tune around and listen to. So RTL SDR. Um, so what this what this actually is is a is a little USB device, and it was designed to receive digital TV in Europe. And the idea is you just plug it in, plug some little antenna into it, and you can start receiving digital TV. And some really smart guy opened it up and started poking around the insides and realized, oh hey, I think I can make this receive any frequency I want. And this is what it looks like when you get it. You can throw away the antenna and the remote. <laughs> you might want an antenna like that. Uh, this is just a picture of the little antenna hookup. It's, you, you can get adapters and stuff like that on Amazon. That's what it looks like. Hook it up to a nice antenna. So what? Why? Um, for me, it's a hobby. It's really interesting to kind of open things up and see what's kind of explore what just what's, what's out there. Whoops. Experimentation. Um, can I decode the bits coming off the weather temperature sensor in my backyard? Public service and cool gear. So actual things that you could do. Uh, 
had a list and it disappeared. Um, so a lot of it's just, you know, like I said, um, listening to scanners, listening to hams, shortwave, just seeing what's out there. Um, so um, I, I saw one, uh, one link to a site where the, somebody had actually used this little device somewhere. I'm not going to pick it up. Um, and he hooked it up to a, um, to a dish, a satellite TV dish, and he pointed out the sky and he let it sit. And he tuned it to um, the, free, the resonant frequency of hydrogen, which is like 1.4 gigahertz or something. And he just put it up in the sky at night and let it sit. And he actually, as, as the Earth rotated and as the, as the dish rotated, as the sky rotated through the sky, or as the dish rotated through the sky, um, he saw this. He saw this spike, and he saw it actually move in frequency as the center of the Milky Way moved across the sky. I thought that was really cool to see. And so this is an up. It's called an up converter. I'm not going to take note. Not going to test you on it. But this uh, this allows you to uh, receive like the the, the shortwave bands. You've got your antenna input and then your antenna output, and you give it some power on the USB, and it it works. It's pretty cool. So this, if you if you guys find this interesting, this is the only link I'm going to give you. Whoops, no. RTLSDR.com. It's basically the clearinghouse of all this kind of info. Uh, they've got links of where to buy the devices, cool things that are kind of going on in the uh, the SDR community, if you will. Um, need experiments to do. So let's listen to some radio. So what I've got going here, if I've got my speaker, I've got the up converter just in pass-through mode, so it's just passing the signal straight through. And I've got the SDR dongle right here, and it's just plugged into my USB. So this program, this is a Windows program called SDR Sharp. Um, actually, I'm going to give you a little word of warning. Um, so I'm, I'm doing this in VMware Fusion. Don't, don't use VMware Fusion for this kind of stuff. Um, it works OK in Windows. If you switch over to Linux, if you're trying to do like Linux VM, your USB support is, I don't know if it's just the device or what, but it, it, it's a little janky, and you have to like keep unplugging the thing, and, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, I think the state of software for Mac is not good, which is unfortunate. So I just I just run Windows VM. Uh, so I'm gonna. Well, that's probably not all that good to see. So I'm just gonna switch this over to use the USB device, and it says it's not working. So I need to unplug this. Bear with me. <coughs> yes. And. Hit play. Let me turn my volume here. And let me squelch so we don't just have static. Is that loud enough back there? Okay. So I'm just going to tune to the, some FM broadcast here. And it's not working. This is not good. So we are in a little bit of a electrical black hole in this building. Can almost barely hear. Let me tune around a little bit. There we go. I'm just going to mute it. <laughs> so uh, you've got the waterfall display here, and you can see the signal coming through. Um, you can play around with the speed, with the, the speed of the waterfall. You can adjust the contrast, all that kind of stuff. And this gray area up here is the, this, this is the FFT display. And you can actually tune around and choose what you're listening to. And i got to turn off snap here. And you can tune around. We're basically just 
tuning the radio, which is not all that exciting, but let me uh, unmute here. Again, you know, Dan, I, I wouldn't put him in that category of being a chirper, a cheap shot. You know, he just plays the game the way it's supposed to be played. So, you know, Minnesota's not sitting thinking that, God, we got to get that Oshie, man. You know, he's such a, you know, blah, 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 blah. He's, he, but he's not that type of guy, so, you know, there's no, no... Uh, all right, sports controversy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I mean, um, you can do other things like adjust the filter width. There's tons of options that if you just turn it on, you probably won't really understand it or care to understand it, but I, I find it fascinating. Um, okay, I have some other frequencies here, but it seems like we're in a bit of a black hole, which is really unfortunate. I'll try some weather radio. Yes, no? No, that's not going to work. It sounds awful. So I have some other things I can show. Fortunately, I prepared for this situation. Uh, I was going to show off some, I was going to do something crazy like string up a big wire antenna, but I already t spent like 10 minutes setting everything up. So um, I can actually record the data coming off the SDR. Um, so what I did at home was I basically just connected the whole thing to my... Uh, my big ham radio antenna in the backyard. <coughs> Grab some sample files here. So let's see, this first one will be the um, 20 meter ham band, so down on 14 megahertz. So this is if you uh, get, get an up converter and you, you can uh, tune around the shortwave bands. So you just choose the IQ file, hit play. Turn down the volume. And you can zoom in here. You can see the, the bandwidth, the entire band at once, which is really cool. Um, let me zoom in on one of these. Um, eliminate the whole thing from the antenna altogether. So it's just a bunch of hams, John, talking. It's not too interesting sometimes. It's usually, oh, what's the weather like in Florida? Oh, it's sunny. Yep, it's cold here in Minnesota. <laughs> I'm going to make a quick adjustment here to my software. And I don't know where it is. Let's see what other sort of things I've got. I also recorded some, uh, oh, voice, I can show you Voice of America on shortwave. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, a lot of times the shortwave stations, the broadcast stations will, uh, as they come on the air, they'll just play some music. Um, and you realize that they're coming on the air. So I think they're over here. Switch it to AM. That doesn't sound like Voice of America. I don't know where they went. Maybe this is it over here. Whoa. I think I also recorded myself tuning around, which uh, throws a little bit of a wrench into the demo. So you can see each one of these little uh, vertical lines is actually a, a station. Tune in here a little bit. Here we go. I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know what she's talking about. So there's tons of stuff out there. Um, let me see what else I had for demos. Oh, uh, so I'll switch over to Linux here. I'm going to show you guys a, a soft piece of software called uh, New Radio, GNU Radio. Is it, is it new or GNU? GNU, okay, GNU Radio. I never know. Flip over here. Do the USB shuffle. 
And there we go. So this is um, called GNU Radio. And what it is, it's a, a block diagram, kind of flowchart way of building a software radio. And you get all these different components that you can put together. So on the left here, we've got the, the SDR source of the signal. Um, and we do some demodulation and some other filtering. And I won't go into the details because it's not really all that interesting for a demo. Um, but if I switch over here and I'll play this one. So this is one that I built for uh, just uh, broadcast FM. And I'll click play if it works. Fingers crossed. And try this one more time. Ha. And you can sort of hear it. Reception here is kind of bad. So let's see. I'll try. Uh, what was the sports station that we were listening to? Is anybody, was it like 90? 90.3, so I'll just switch this. Come on. Sports radio, give me sports radio. Oh, 99.3. Try 99.5. There's a signal. A lot of it's due to this antenna and we're just inside the building, so. Um, this is kind of a cool uh, toolkit once you kind of get into the guts of uh, radio and demodulation and all that kind of stuff. Um, one, of my, one of my goals is to actually use this to uh, pull the bits off of a wireless temperature sensor that I have. And I've seen videos of people doing it in their software that will do it automatically, but apparently the model that I have, nobody's like added the code for that yet. So um, that's one of my projects. Yes. don't know. I think, uh, okay, so I'm completely shooting you from the hip here, but so I, I think it's, there's something called the Nyquist theorem where you have to sample something at twice the frequency to save it, to, to keep the, to keep that data. Um, at this point, um, the, the 44 kilohertz is actually like the sampling rate and it's, it's different than tuning a radio to like 89 megahertz. Yeah, yeah. It's fundamentally different. But, yeah. but You'd have to re it, so. you'd have to use a higher sampling rate. Yeah. Uh, let me pull out some other notes here. I've got some other cool things to show. Uh, so I'm going to attempt aircraft tracking, and I don't know if it's actually going to work. And flip back over. Pardon me while I do the VMware shuffle again. Pause. Start Windows. And while this is resuming, I'm going to do an antenna shift. Yep. Yeah, I noticed uh, the person this is next to, there's kind of a main signal. And then two smaller signals like right on the outside. On either side of it? Yeah. Oh, like in the FM. So the question was, uh, like on the FM broadcast, you saw the main signal in the center and then the two sort of square signals on either side. Um, those are just called sidebands. I think they're, a lot of times they're unused here, um, but I think that's, that's space kind of reserved for like HD radio. What's it? RDS, radio Oh, so the question was RDS. Yeah, so the uh, SDR Sharp will actually, if you're tuned into a station, it will pick up that, that little like textual description of the station in, in display, which is uh, uh, kind of cool. So let me uh, switch over here. I apologize for the fiddliness and the downtime. 
So I'm going to start up a app here called ADSB Sharp. And I'm just going to turn it on. And then ADSB Scope. So these, these two apps actually talk to each other. And I'm going to turn this on. Network client active. And so we're receiving some stuff here. So this is actually probably not a really good demo. And I hate to say that, but um, this, this uh, so what we're doing is we're receiving little data packets uh, from airplanes either overhead or at the airport. Um, and a lot of times these data packets will actually have the heading, the speed, uh, latitude and longitude uh, of the plane um, in flight. And if I had a better antenna, we'd actually get little aircraft uh, uh, icons showing up on the map here and uh, flying around. But um, doesn't look like it's working too well. Usually this little, uh, this box up here in the corner, I get a lot more data when I have a decent signal. So um, unfortunately, this isn't all that exciting of a demo. But the, the software's out there, and it's, it's cool to, to play with uh, uh, if you've got the time for it. So, so is this yes, yeah. So the, the plane will actually show up on the map. And one, as it gets. Uh, new coordinates, it'll just show up. You can click it, you can see like the, the I think like the flight, not the flight number, but the, the model, um, like you'll see um, like FedEx 357 or something like coming in and I've seen planes landing and you know, coming into Minneapolis airport. So um, this is not going as well as I was hoping. Yeah, so the question was, do I have anything that can show the spectrum larger of the, than the bandwidth of the, uh, of the actual device? Yeah, you have one cell phone. yeah um, so you can actually set the center frequency, so I could actually tune it up to the cell phone frequency and then see it. Um, it does see a specific, like, like one megahertz chunk of the spectrum at a time. Um, but you can, it, it's cool because it's actually getting that whole chunk of the spectrum at, at once. So I'm going to attempt internet access. I'm going to show you a web-based SDR, which is actually kind of cool. Is guest the actual correct Wi-Fi here? OK. I'm, I'm going to blindly trust it. Don't blindly trust Wi-Fi. So web SDR org if it loads slowly um, so what this is is a bunch of people who have either built their own SDR or they have software or they, ha they have they've allowed access to it uh, over the internet so I'm just going to choose this guy uh, in the Netherlands hopefully it loads quickly no oh I bet I'm being blocked on the port uh, I'll try this guy. Nope. Thanks. Okay. So when you go home, go to webstr.org, click that first link. Um, there's a Java version, but also an HTML5 version, which is really cool. You'll get a a scope, a uh, waterfall view, um, and you can tune around. It's really cool. Um, so I guess that's all I have for all my demos and content. Um, does anybody have any requests of things to see or questions? Yep. Yeah, can you explain about the waterfall view more? Sure. Let me swipe, switch over to it. So the, the dongle itself is tuned to a, a specific frequency. So in this case, 105.5. And that's, that's this center frequency here. And you've got the full bandwidth. So you've got at the bottom like 105.3 on the left, and then 105.6 on the right. And the, the gray thing is actually where you're tuned. So you can see the dongle is, 
getting this large swath of bandwidth at once, uh, and then you can actually just tune it to the actual frequency that you want to actually listen to. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I can you can adjust the contrast. So it's like the just how strong the signal is. So um, as a ham, this is really cool to see. If I'm looking at a chunk of the HF bands, um, I can just let this run, and if I can see signals popping up, instead of having to sit and tune around on my dial and search for things, so they just they just pop up. Yep. So okay, so the question was with the full frequency range. So just the USB dongle itself uh, will receive, I think, 70 megahertz to like 1.2 gigahertz, which is pretty good, pretty good chunk. Um, and then with the up converter, it just um, shifts all the frequencies by 125 megahertz. So that gives you access to the uh, the HF and shortwave stuff. Oh, so the question was, is, was HE radio a what standard? IP, I've never heard, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yep. Uh, I don't know if it can tune the HD radio signals. Um, I think, so you can set this to wide FM mode and you get a wider, um, chunk of audio that you can listen to, and I've, I don't know if it, if the soft if SDR Sharp itself will tune that that wide chunk of, of bandwidth that you need. It's just a few extra kilohertz on each end, but I don't know if it uh, if it'll actually tune that. You can tune it, you just can't use both. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yep. Is there a software update? Is there a possibility to software? Yeah. So SDR Sharp isn't actually the only like decoding software. There's other ones like I think there's one called like HD SDR. Um, there's t like there's just tons of different uh, decoding apps. This is by no means this is not the only one. Oh yeah. Oh, so the question was: Is it commercial? This is free. Yep. Uh, uh, so armor radio. Um, I don't know what armor radio is. <laughs> Oh, okay, so, yep. yep, okay, so the question was about, like, like encoded digital police and fire communications. Um, actually, I did, um, there's one called, like, I forget the name of the standard, but it's, what it basically is, is like a streamed, like, compressed audio file over the air, um, and I actually was getting some of that from, like, Minneapolis Airport, so there, there are ways that you get, there are apps that you can, use to pipe the audio through this app or other SDR apps um, to decode it. Yep. Right, yeah, digital. Yeah, so the, the, it was, the comment was digital is actually, it's not actually HD, it's just digital, it's different. <laughs> Yeah, so the question was APRS. So APRS is a, uh, uh, at least on the ham radio side, it's uh, a, a way to transmit like latitude and longitude, like coordinates uh, to other hams and you can track them. Um, and the question was, have I, can you do that? And the answer is yes, <laughs> I've done it. With this setup? With this setup, yep. Yeah. I can show you later if you want to see it. Thank you. Yep. Yep. This blue thing? So this is the up converter box. This just gives me access to the HF and shortwave bands. Um, there's just a circuit board in it, and it's, I actually have it in pass-through mode because I needed it for the connectors. What does that cost? Uh, so the question was the cost. Uh, the, the board itself is like 50, and then the case is like 15 bucks. So um, I guess,
Yeah, so the question was tuning Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So not with this dongle, um, th the max frequency is like 1.2 gigahertz. You'd probably need a down converter. Um, but I think the problem is the bandwidth of Wi-Fi is, is greater than the capability of the dongle itself. So um, you'd probably need to get one of those fancy SDRs if you wanted to, to do that sort of analysis on it. Hundred bucks or more. Yep. Uh, so I guess that's it. Um, I guess if I would leave you with a parting thought is, if this interests you, um, look into getting your ham radio license because it will make you a better hacker. And that's it. <laughs>